Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. Bismillah rahim Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. As for Ishaq alayhi salam, his brother, he is the one that the Jews take pride in saying that we came from his lineage and we are the real people and we are the chosen people. There are two types of general, general two types of Jews and from them come out little sects. There are the, uh, what you call the uh, universal types of Jews, they're the mainstream, they're the common Jews, and there are the tribal types of Jews, among them are the Zionists. So these people, the Zionists and tribal type, they're very uh, fanatic in their ways. They're the ones who say that people on earth are goyims. Goyims is, like, is in Hebrew saying that you're something similar to uh, animals, that you were created to serve them. And this is in their Torah, in their, their Bible. And as for the rest of them, they believe that they don't have to have a land. They say we have to live among everybody. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about them, but they pride themselves in being from Ishaq, and they refused to say that, that, that Ismail is a prophet, Ishmael, and they don't look at him as any significance because the Arabs came from him, and they despise Muhammad وسلم, because he was an Arab, and they're the children of Israel. Israel is Yaqub, by the way, and it is one of the reasons. So they don't take Ismail, السلام, or we take Ishaq. السلام. He is a prophet of Allah, a messenger of Allah, and we love him in a dorm. If he was alive over here and, he, and we needed to protect him, we'll protect him with our blood. We love him more than ourselves and more than our parents. They are prophets of Allah and messengers of God. So alhamdulillah for the blessing of Islam. Uh, Ishaq alayhi salam lived, and Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sarah, his mother, they lived to, to see him. He grew up and he was righteous. And Allah mentions him in the Quran among the messengers of Allah, the devout ones. Then he had a son named Yaqub alayhi salam, Jacob. Yaqub alayhi salam also lived to see his grandmother Sarah and his grandfather Ibrahim alayhi salam before they died. Yaqub alayhi salam is also mentioned in the Quran. As I said before, his name is Yaqub and Israel. Israel, Israel. And they lived in Palestine. Yaqub alayhi salam grew old and he had two wives in the beginning. The, from the first wife, he had, he had, uh, how many, let me count them, <laughs> how many children? So you have, he had ten children from the first wife, and two children, two boys, from the second wife. The ten children from the first wife came from the lineage of one of the sons of Noah. And the other ones came from the lineage of the other sons of Noah. The two sons that came from the second wife were better in conduct and righteousness than all the other ten brothers. They were Benjamin or Benjamin in English, and the second one was Prophet Yusuf. So they were brothers from the same mother, the other ten from the other mother. Yaqub loved. His son Yusuf السلام, and after him uh, Benjamin or Benjamin before his other ten sons. He loved them more. And the reason why he loved them more is not because of favoritism, unfair favoritism. He loved them because they were more righteous in conduct and they were more pleasing to Allah than the others. Now here is a question. Are parents allowed to love some of their children more than others? Yes. Because we can't control our love. Love is in the heart, and only Allah can control that. There's no such thing as unconditional love, and they teach you this about romance and baloney, about husband, you know, man and woman loving each other unconditionally, and, uh, and uh, love from first sight. There is no such thing. What we do have is action, and from that comes love. Love comes from treatment. There is instinctive love, which Allah gave us towards our parents, yes. But even that one can be lost and we can't control it. Therefore, love for your children can vary. But here is the difference. The treatment must not vary. You treat them all equally. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa he was sitting once, 
and a man entered from the Arab tribes. He had a son and he placed his little son on his lap. The man sat and he placed his son where? On his lap. Shortly after, his daughter came in, little daughter about five, four years old, she walked in. And her father put her on the ground beside him. So he didn't put her up like his son on his lap. You all know the Arabs, especially in those days, they favored boys more than girls. So he put her on the ground and he favored his son. The Prophet ﷺ immediately said to him, You have not done justice. Ma adalt. You have not done justice. You are not fair. He said, How, Ya Rasulullah? He said, You favored your son and you neglected your daughter. You have to treat them the same. Put them both on your lap or both on the floor. Other than absolute justice in the treatment of our children. However, the ten brothers of Yusuf السلام, and Binyamin, they got very jealous. And by the way, they were older than them. They got jealous of Yusuf السلام, a lot because they used to say, our father loves him more. And here is the story and the reflections on his life. Yusuf السلام, as I said before, he was extraordinarily attractive. In fact, not just attractive, you know how you have different types of looks in people? We say handsome, sometimes we say attractive, other times we say um, beautiful, and there are times when we say hypnotizing. You use all these words, right? Hypnotizing. Yusuf السلام, was all for. <laughs> he was hypnotizing, attractive, beautiful, handsome, and on top of that, his character was even more beautiful. So this is the type of man that women only dream of. And I wanted to go a little bit into Yusuf السلام, before I talk about Lut السلام, because I just wanted to mention something very important about the beginning of his life. And that is the fact that Allah had given Yusuf السلام, the beauty, inner and outer beauty, beauty, and yet he had to suffer and go through trials a lot. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam names him Al Karim, Ibn Al Karim, Ibn Al Karim, Ibn Al Karim. He's the only messenger that is called the Honorable, Son of the Honorable, Son of an Honorable, Son of an Honorable. Who are they? Yusuf the son of the Prophet Ya'qub, the son of the Prophet uh, Ishaq, the, pro the son of the Prophet Ibrahim. Four lines. Great grandfather, grandfather and father are all messengers of Allah. Not just prophets, but messengers of the highest of messengers. So imagine being like that. Right? We always proud ourselves. My father, he was this or that. My grandfather was this or that. But imagine you say, my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather were all messengers of Allah. <laughs> Prophets. It's amazing. It didn't exist for any other man in history as far as we know. Only Yusuf alayhi salam. Yet he went through trials. Now Yusuf alayhi salam was extremely handsome, as we said, that any woman would dream of. However, there were one group of people, if they lived at his time, they would also dream of him. And they were men. <laughs> and they were the people of Lut alayhi salam. Lut alayhi salam, now I'm taking you back, and insha'Allah, we'll leave the rest of the story of Yusuf alayhi salam till the next class that I have you with. Lut alayhi salam was sent to the most difficult of duties that you can think of. Like, I mean, you would probably wish if you were given his duty or the duty of going and calling people and suffering blood and pain, fighting physically, you would say, I'd fight physically better than what Lut السلام, was sent with. He was sent to a people who were the most degenerated of moral values on the face of the earth that time. Today, they are worse. But that time, the most degenerated. And the first that you will hear of such type of people. So Allah sent them a warner, an advisor out of his mercy. They were the homosexuals. Men who found attractiveness in an intimate manner towards Ben. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in the Quran. How is this? You find attractiveness in your intimacy towards men instead of women? 
I did not create you that way, in other words. Allah says, I didn't create you that way. Since Allah did not create us with that, how do we explain this? Well, our scholars tell us, and from the verses of the Qur'an, we say, this is an unnatural act which has got a strong connection with the, psycholo with the psychology of the person. These people, out of their own choices, as they were growing up, led themselves in that direction. I've mentioned this before, but I just want to mention it again because I can see new faces here. Alhamdulillah, and with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from myself, I've counseled young men who were tested with this uh, terrible disease. Not just one, maybe about four or five of them. And I've also, two of them were young ladies, girls, and they also had the other, the other type of intimacy. So they came to me, alhamdulillah, we were able to convince them. It was a revert. The, the, the only thing I saw that I had to convince them, alhamdulillah, with all four of them, it worked. Four boys and two girls. It all worked, alhamdulillah. They're all safe from it. The thing that helped me was that they were Muslims. So they believed in Allah and they didn't like what they were doing. What I mean by like, in their, in their reasoning, they knew it was wrong. And they didn't want to anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in their desires, they liked it. But they hated it. They knew it was wrong because they don't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with it. So that was a step. They worked their brains. And the other thing, you know, we convinced them, used reverse psychology with them, and reminded them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And alhamdulillah, they stopped. I remember one particular sister. She had just met some of these types of girls. And they convinced her that she is a female... Uh, you know, homosexual or lesbian. And alhamdulillah, the things I said to her were as follows. I said, sister, before you met these girls, did you think that you were like that? She said, never crossed my mind. I said, so what makes you now think so? She said, when I met these. I said, so you met them and you started thinking like that. How long have you known them for? She said, about two months. I said, have you done anything? She said, no. So alhamdulillah. Well, if you, as soon as you take the next steps, you start to, it's, it becomes diff, more difficult to get out of it. Whether it's this or whether it's any sin. Any sin we take further and further, the shaitan works step by step. That's how he works. He works step by step. It doesn't work quickly like 10 steps. Step by step. And the further you go, the harder it is to come back. Like swimming in an ocean. The further you go deep into it, the more of a challenge to come back it is. That's exactly how sins are, brothers and sisters. You lead from minor to bigger to bigger until finally you lose everything, including even your, your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one of the ways. And alhamdulillah, I said to this sister, I said, so they convinced you. She said, you know, what? I never thought of it that way. I never thought like that before and now I am. Simple stuff. I said, if I brought you a very handsome young man right now, the one that you like. Now she likes sportsmen, you're right. And I said, if I brought you a nice sports person, you know, like maybe an Olympian uh, Taekwondo champ. <laughs> and I said, would you? she said, yes, I would, I, would, I would marry him. Why not? I would get to know him. I said, uh, Alhamdulillah, then that means you are not what they say. So long as you still have that natural desire. Alhamdulillah, she went away. Uh, I don't want to go too much detail in case we identify her. But also the other brothers, we had similar occasions with them. So one of them took about a year to get out of the situation. It was merely desires and thoughts. And they had done some things, but not too deep. But Alhamdulillah, it was reversed. Now I want to ask you a question. As a man or as a woman, do you think it's natural unless you've got a deformity or you go too old in age, is it natural for you to lose complete desire towards women? Do you think that's natural? I mean, a man is married. Now, I know there's young people here, but uh, inshallah, may Allah get you married soon. But a man, you're married, right? Even after years of marriage, subhanAllah, this same woman, after years of marriage, and this same man, after years and years of marriage, Allah has created a natural biological buildup within our bodies. When this biological buildup grows, you desire your husband, you desire your wife, even though you've been years and years. You'd say to yourself, well, it's time to get bored of them. But this desire stays in you. So it's natural to desire to this opposite gender, but it's unnatural to desire with the other one, because the other one, they, you, you, can, you can actually get out of it again. And you weren't born with it. Now, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said, the men have to cover themselves in front of other men in a certain way. Isn't that right? From the navel to the knee, even in front of other men. 
There is a wisdom behind it. Because every person has an innate curiosity. Yes, it's a curiosity. And women have to cover in front of other women from navel to knee as well. Because there is also that curiosity. And the shaitan always goes with the curiosity. That's how he made Adam a.s. eat from the tree. He didn't eat because Adam a.s. was weak in his iman. But he went to his curiosity and he said to him, Ah, the only, why? You're forbidden from it because there's a secret. And you're not going to know that secret until you eat from it. So he ate and what was the secret? Nothing. There was no secret. The shaitan laughed his head off and thought that he had won. But guess what? Adam a.s. did not come down to earth so he can stay here. Everyone who dives down into the ocean, uh, the diver that goes down into the ocean comes out with pearls. And Adam a.s. dived down to the earth and he's returned back with pearls. And this is the whole idea. We come up with pearls to enter paradise in, 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 in a more developed way, alhamdulillah. So Lut a.s. was sent to these people. Not one of them, not one single person, Man or woman obeyed Lut alayhi salam. It is said in narrations that he stayed for more, Allahu alam how many years, but decades. Not one of them accepted his call. He had daughters. He had three daughters, Lut alayhi salam, and a wife. His wife was a disbeliever. And Allah mentions her in the Quran. She used to help the men. She was a matchmaker for the men. Afterwards. And Lut salam couldn't stay with her either. But he had three daughters from her. Subhanallah, it was just for the Prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put him in that situation and she disbelieved. In our time, we're not, we're not permitted in our sharia, in our deen, after the Prophet salam, to marry someone like that. But it was a circumstance for him. He was in a necessity. However, his daughters were all believers. And the wife of Lut, her descriptions about her being disbeliever is in the Quran. It's also in hadith that she used to try and help the men. And I'll tell you soon what I'm talking about. His daughters became believers. So remember last week when I told you the two, the two angels came to Ibrahim alayhi salam and they told him, gave him news that he's going to have a son. They said, we have come to the people of Lut. So they went to the people of Lut to destroy them. Every people that came to a prophet, Allah gave him chances and chances and chances. And in the end, after warnings, they disbelieved and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them and brought them back to him. So they went to destroy them. It is said, Allahu A'lam, we don't know which two angels they were, but it is said that it is Jibreel alayhi salam and Mikail. When they came to the people of Lut, and it was a place called Sodom. Ever heard of Sodom? Sodom and, and, and uh, Gomorrah? It's a place in Jordan. Okay, not to th think ill of Jordan, but it, that's where it was. And right now, it is called the Dead Sea. The, where, the, where the towns were, it's now called the Dead Sea. There's only a sea, which is called the Dead Sea there. There are no towns anymore. And if you were to look at that sea, you will find that only, not many fish live in it. And every now and then you will find special types of stones floating on top. And they are heat conductors. They explode. And they say, scientists tell us about the Dead Sea, that it's extremely dense water. It's difficult for anyone to drown in it. I'll come back to that in a minute, inshallah. There were seven cities for the people of Sodom. See, I don't like calling them homosexuals or gay. I call them Sodomites. And they know what that means and they hate it. Because you're referring them back to their origin. And this is the truth. They are Sodomites, Sodomiyun. Some people call them Lutiyun. In Arabic, I say, this person is a Luti. Don't say that. Lut is a prophet, alayhi salam. Don't say that he's like Lut. Lut, alayhi salam, wasn't a homosexual. So there were Sodom, Yun, Sodom. Their people were Sodoms. And there were seven cities. The two angels entered. And they went to a well. And the way they entered, subhanAllah, was in the form of the most extremely handsome men that you can lay your eyes on. They came in the form of handsome men. When they entered, one of the daughters of Lut, alayhi salam, was at a well. And she saw these men. So she raced to her father and said, Father, I just saw two men and they are extremely handsome. I've never seen people like them before. Meaning, please go and advise them not to come in here. So Prophet Lut went to them. And you know, it is from the nature of prophets and their character. 
that they can't be rude. They can't just kick you out and tell you go, but they try to hint it to you. And that's how we should all take that trait. Be sensitive and um, you know, sensible and considerate to people's feelings. So Lut went to them and he tried to hint to them. He said, you're stranger people. I've never seen people like you here. They said, yes. And they didn't tell him why they're there. And he said to them, you know what? This land that you're in, I have never seen more corrupt and terrible than this land. He's trying to hint to them, don't come and live here. Leave, go. But they wouldn't leave. So then he invited them to his house. When they were in the house, it says in the hadith that Lut Salam's wife, the disbeliever, went out to the people and she informed them of these two men. She said to them, there are the most handsome men in, my, in our house. The next day, the men came to the house of Lut salam. This is also in the Quran, you'll find it in the tafsir. I just don't have time to go through it all. They came to his house in large numbers and they started to bang his door. They almost uh, you know, threw his door down. And they would say to him words like this, Lut, we know you have them in there. Let them out. <laughs> Amazing. You know? And Lut salam, was very embarrassed. He thought these people were just men you know, coming as guests. So Lut opened the door and he looked at them and said to them, Fear your Lord. And he, was, and he said these words to them in the Quran. Alaysa fikum rajulur rashid? Is there not one man even among you who thinks, who has some wisdom? They said, let him out, ya Lord. We are not going to obey what you're saying. He said, don't you fear God that will bring on you, upon you a punishment? And then one of the men, who was the angel, came and tapped Lut Aisam and said, close the door and come in. He came inside and he said to him, we are messengers from your Lord. Here the narration said that it was Jibreel alayhi salam, and Allah knows best. So Jibreel alayhi salam said, we have come with a command from your Lord to destroy them. Take your family, your daughters, wait for the night, sahar. Sahar in Arabic means the darkness of the night. So there was no moon and absolute darkness. Everybody's asleep. He said, in the middle of the night, take your daughters and run. Run away and don't even look back. We are going to destroy the people of this town. The men were still banging on the door. So Jibreel opened the door. He grabbed some dust, as in the hadith. And he blew them in their faces. And they all became blind. They all became blind. And they went away to their homes, as the hadith says, يَتَحَسَّسُونَ al judran. They went touching the walls and pillars to know where they're going, because they were blind. And they said, Saharana Lut. This is in the hadith. Lut has done sorcery upon us. Every messenger that came, this is what their people used to say. They've done magic. And they said this about Prophet Muhammad Because They couldn't explain what this Qur'an is, so they said it's words of sorcery. But it's not. We know it's not. And they said, we will see what's going to happen to you tomorrow, Ya Lut. Tomorrow in the morning is our appointment. Allah replied to them in the Qur'an saying, فَصَبَّحَهُمْ بُكْرَةً عَذَابٌ مُسْتَقْرٍ The next morning, Allah met them with a terrible punishment. Lut alayhi salam, in the middle of the night, Allah says, وَنَجَّيْنَاهُمْ بِسَحَرٍ We saved Lut and his daughters in the middle of the night. إِلَّا Another verse is, إِلَّا عَجُوزٌ فِي الْغَابِرِينَ Except an old woman who stayed with the disbelievers. That was his wife. Allah did not save Lut alayhi salam's wife. She stayed with them. The next morning they woke up, Allahu Akbar. And this is what the hadith says. The angel, and as we presume, it's probably Jibreel alayhi salam, he took one feather out of his wing, one feather, and he placed it underneath the towns. How many towns did we say they were? Seven. With one feather from the wings of Jibreel alayhi salam, he carried seven cities. We're talking about Meadow Heights, Broadmeadows, Glenroy, Faulkner, Preston, Coburg, Brunswick, all those. Seven cities with one feather. That's, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is great. Subhana. We cannot describe him. This is only his creation. And look how. So beware anyone to defy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He placed his feather under seven cities. In the hadith it says he lifted him. 
He lifted them up until it reached the worldly sky, so it went up into a particular horizon. And then it rained upon them rocks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Quran, rocks of fire. They ignite. And he screamed in them, and they all died. And he twisted the seven cities upside down and crushed them into the ground. And then there developed above it a huge sea. Today, I watched a documentary about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and I found they were studying the biblical term. It's very close to the Quran, but they thought it was a landslide. They were slid. But the, Quran, the, the hadith of Prophet says, he twisted their cities. And the Quran says he twisted their cities upside down. He made it up, down. So twisted upside down. I looked at the, they looked at the edges of the, uh, of, the, of the mountains around it. And subhanAllah, it looked like finger, like, like finger um, uh, like, like lanes, lanes like a person places his finger in there. And I said, subhanAllah, the hadith talks about wings. And I thought, wow, how it is actually as if someone scooped it out. And now it is called Al-Bahr Al-Mayyit, the Dead Sea. This is what happened to the people of Sadun and in the Quran and obviously in our Sunnah. This type of a relationship is forbidden. And we must stick to the fiqh uh, restrictions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given us in relation to guarding our modesty and decency even in front of the men. It's very funny and I end it with this. When we say hijab, what do you think of? Last question. When I say hijab, what do you think of? Hijab. Who do you think of? Women? Women in a scarf. That's what we, we think of a scarf and women. There are two problems. Not with you, brother, but we all answer that. Two problems what people answer. Scarf and women. Hijab does not mean scarf, and hijab does not only apply to women. In fact, it applies to men before women. Allah said in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الْقُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Tell the male believers to lower their gaze. This is part of hijab. Hijab means to guard. Guard your gaze from looking in a lustful manner towards women. He said, وَقُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ And then, second, say to the Muslim women believers to guard also their sight. So hijab doesn't mean scarf. It means also the, the behavior <coughs> and the clothing and the words. So thank you for listening. So jazakumullah khair for being here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our good deeds. May Allah forgive us, give us his mercy and grant us his jannah. Ameen. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.